Well, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, nice to see so many people here. Um, just a couple of points to uh, you know, start with. Uh, there is live streaming. I think the download is good enough. Maybe your, your face will be uh, shown. And if that's not an acceptable to you, then I see
And this is the overall site location. Uh, the proposal goes uh, from Iceland, which is the section that comes in at the top. It then heads towards Wellington, or coming back towards Red Lodge, Chippenham, Snowell, and then we have a grid connection that goes past Borden and connects to the Bell bus station. <laughs> This is showing both the site and the district boundaries. So you can see it's roughly half and half between the East Cambridge District Council and the like Suffolk District Council. And just note it is mentioned on this screen, but option one, which is unbearable, is the Suffolk Cambridge District Council. Option two is the Suffolk Cambridge District a bit of orientation of where the site is. The Iceland village is northwest of parcel E05. That parcel there. Within our district is E05 and E C01. The rest of the proposal is within public. E05 is the solar farm and F01 is the major grassland and archaeological mitigation area. In this side of the road, Suffolk has the majority of the so far, the nearest set of factory energy storage systems and substation <laughs> DC is in E33, which is that part of the Uh, currently, West is all within East Cambridge District Council. W01 and W15 are the parcels of Soda Park, and W17 is the fence and substation area. Yeah. Uh, the the farm, facility, and substation is that part of there. And this is the grid connection from Snowwell towards Burwell, and it goes to the border. So Snowwell is at this time, and that's the Burwell bus station. You should have it in hard copy. But if you get the <laughs> this is the on the station, and again, um, option one has been removed. Option two remains, and um, the position is not allowed to provide a direct 400 foot volt cable direct into the network. Uh, that is the backup option, of course. Never discussion. I have got the time to discuss the idea of the rare to go to the Iceland, then a chicken, next time here, then I'll call them and then we can look at the time for the proposal is for an energy farm which includes both solar farms and batteries. It's Measured excluding the care routes at 981 hectares. Above the area stated, currently limits are seeking effective space to approve a development consent order that grants legislation in order to both build, operate, and decommission the development. The legislation, when 
if granted, can also remove substantial amount of existing legislation that the tax to comply with. This is all part of that development consent order or CPO, which by the age unique. An envelope which the uh, worker to means that application is dependent on the worst case scenario, so it's the max of the measurement for whatever would be the most um, harmful. Um, I'm not going to go through all the elements of the planet as there's a lot here, but you can see all the measurements within paragraph 6.2 of my report. The main elements. Um, is the third panel, which had a maximum height of 2.5 meters. The substation, which had a maximum height of 10 meters. And the battery uh, containers or air systems, which had a maximum height of 6 meters. And the cycle website A has a maximum dimension of the compound of 83,000 square meters. The water tank is required for our A fire and um, depending on the battery technology uh, would be have a maximum cubic meter capacity of 242.5. The main considerations uh, are principal climate change, cultural heritage, ecology, land usage of the industry, noise, vibrations, output supply glare. The total economic of it and air quality. So, to confirm, these are the main considerations for East Cambridge District Council as uh, they find the sort of our reading. Other elements such as uh, highway safety, uh, drainage, will be kind of like the county council, the local fire authority, and the local highway authority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, power for around 200,000 homes. Um, but this is indicative because it depends on you know, the how, what kind of, you know, the air such as a kettle, for instance, is that you know, the energy will be set up dominantly. Just give a uh, reference to how much energy we already created at the District Council. In 2019, we created around 427,000 megawatts of energy. From solar and straw burning. That's approximately 56 between those two elements. That would power approximately 100,000 to 145,000 homes. The principle of solar farms and energy creation, the new energy creation in East County District Council is supported. So the principle of this development should be supported. And in 21st October 2019, this council declared a climate emergency. The fairness of renewable energy has to be given substantial positive weight, our recommendation. And for that reason, because it's such a principle. Just to provide some additional batteries, batteries are going to require in some form in order to store energy with a surplus. For instance, the uh, third farm that's probably going around 1 pm when the sun is at its peak. Then it'll feed into the grid when the, there's high demand, which usually is somewhere between 6 and 7 pm when people go home. The batteries can also take energy out of the national grid when there's surplus and then feed back when there's a high demand. So it's not just the energy from the solar farms that it can store. Uh, this is the historic park and garden of Chickaloo, which extends all the way down in a, a sort of avenue, all the way down to Newmarket, which is called the Mine Kiln. At the very end, there's a building with Holy Gold Local List, which is this building here. On the map, that's the historic park and garden. And you've got the first farm on both sides of the historic park and garden. In consultation with our conservation officer, the project is considered to cause substantial harm to the setting of this historic park and garden. And the benefits of renewable energy is not considered outweigh this substantial harm, as are other sites that could provide renewable energy. 
I'll come on to a bit later if I've got an image. You can see Ely Cathedral on the Lion Kilns, however, it's a long distance view and we don't think it's going to cause detrimental harm on setting off the cathedral. This is a visiting and photo montage along the avenue in the front of the garden. So the top of this is just visiting, and then the bottom of this shows the red lines, which will show what the impact the photo will have on both sides of the avenue. Just to um, go to the ecology, and um, we have worked with uh, the Wildlife Trust, County Council of Ecologists, as well as both on public sites for a joint response that was in local in Paris Forks. The key parts of this are there are concerns over the work done by the Perth uh, this includes so the Stone Cove survey has done correctly, um, lack of conservative survey, and how that one can affect each of the Petro surveys aren't completed, surveys of arable field margins not complete for all arable farms, private territory not mapped out, and phase one private map is inaccurate places. On this basis, the councils do not agree that there would be no significant residential effect to ecology in the sectors during construction and operation proposal. And given that we don't know the level of harm, we cannot work out if there will be a net benefit from the proposal. Members would also note in Appendix 3 that the long term plan around Snailwell is to create a new biodiversity area which will connect all the Ground and biodiversity protected areas together, which is where W01 and W02 are located. So they have provided an area of biodiversity protection, which is Eco 4, which is smaller than what has been recommended, but would allow some level of connection between those elements. I'm going to go quickly through the few points. Um, and I'll start with the impact of EO5 near Iceland. So, this is uh, viewpoint five. So, the first top slide or top image is near one, uh, sorry, existing. That's how it is currently. That's how it looks near one. And that's how it looks near 16. The landscape has matured. Yeah, just show those images. <coughs> uh, view point 11, so this is uh, on the outside of the field. So again, you have at the top existing, then you have year one, and then you have year 15. Point thirty-two. So this is now looking towards parcel uh, W ten, which is near Twickenham. So again, existing top, sorry, it's year one, middle, and then year fifteen top. Two points thirty-three. This is uh, excellent to the whole farm. This is looking towards parcel W eleven and W twelve. So again, existing at the top, year one, and then year 15 at the bottom. Right. So I'll just repeat that. So this is coming from the whole farm, and then this is looking towards the 11 to 12, and then existing year one, year 15. <laughs> Viewpoint 38, so this is <laughs> over the line kill, facing towards the Parts of W04, W05, and W07. So that we should have found the Kidman along this direct part of the garden. And again, existing at the top, you have the implant and then you have the thing. Um, this is a Google image, um, which is again over the line of kilns. You can see the cathedral though, very slightly in the background. You then have the stretch park and garden running across here, yeah, and you can see the sparkles of W05 and W07. Viewpoint 
moving towards malware, looking at uh, viewpoint 4.1, looking towards part of WO3, thinking again existing year one and year 15. Moving to the other side, now viewpoint 46, facing towards W01, W02, and ECO4. Again, existing year one and year 15. Just to write a short conclusion on that, it impact that has said any long term harm or impact is anything over five years. By year 15, it's been suggested by our lab there will be no individual significant harm, which does mean that up to 10 years of long term harm from this proposal. However, the cumulative impact is considered to cause significant landscape harm across this part of the district. And this is a uh, recent tree preservation order um, in Snowwell on Chipland Road. Uh, and this was done to protect a maturing avenue of trees that form a port landscape feature along this road. And uh, these are the submitted um, tree constraint reports. Um, you can see different parts of the site have been given the same site plan and the same impact as in growing snow trees. Um, this load of information, as you can imagine, is extremely important for this lot of pilot development. And um, there has confirmed, though, on the 1st of November that they are going to a new agricultural assessment and that was made on the 27th of November this year. Moving on to noise vibration, dust, light flare. Our uh, Eyebright Health team has been working with the public health parks in order to provide the conclusions in the local impact report. We would be seeking to limit hours of construction work and also more tight control over when filing operations can take place and filing has been found to be quite disturbing if people when they're trying to relax. It's not a loud noise, it's very repetitive noise and it can cause great disturbance. The build is likely to take between three and five years if a uh, consent order is granted. And the requirements within that direct consent order will need to ensure long term residential immunity is protected. Moving on to social economics. Um, again, our economic officers work with his counterparts and different authorities and in order to form a collective view. Uh, so specialists have considered that there is a potential concern about methodologies that have used that by unlisted assumptions and therefore not valid conclusions as part of their own statement. While we're not an expert in the horse race industry, one potential significant harm is to that industry that is centered around new markets. And I know we have people who are experts here today, so they might be able to find more detail. And we would want support so that those experts have their time to provide their advice both here and then to the planning advice later on. There is also potential substantial concern over the detrimental impact along the A142, which stretches from now on to Lake Capital Way. Sorry. Uh, during construction phases, and that's because of the amount of size of the amount of construction work that could be taking place. The proposal, no matter the grade of the agricultural land, which I know the question being raised, it is going to lose a large amount of agricultural land for at least 40 years if the all is granted. That is a consideration. <coughs> so the information so far submitted has led to many concerns both within this council and outside of this council to the proposed developments. Uh, battery, uh, air quality, battery safety, and just a quick on air quality during construction. There are no concerns that the construction operation decommissioning will have any concern of vehicle air pollution. Moving on to battery safety, the battery safety of batteries are technologies very much constantly changing from what we have gathered. 
there needs to be uh, fire greater detail to ensure appropriate mitigation if there was a fire. And we know that they provide a new fire safety management plan on the 11th of November. However, the final factory type is unlikely to be defined in that document. And different batteries might require radically different measures on how you control a fire if there was one. Uh, moving on to the summary there. My recommendation is one of those we should put forward an objection as details within paragraph 1.1 of my report and appendix one. Thank you, Chair, and it's always happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> may have concluded with my chair of the map. Uh, I've had reports that there's been extremely good cooperation between Office of the Council, District Council, and West Suburb. And uh, roughly speaking, the size of the application is about 50 50 between the two authorities. But it is always the same to know that there's been good sort of teamwork between the two authorities. Uh, we have a we have a, our first speaker, and uh, I, I believe she had some other business in another place. Uh, and if I can ask the leader, the honourable uh, the in this council, uh, to uh, come up to the desk, you may want to sit since there's only one of you. You may want to sit with the NC, yeah. and that would allow the, the people in the audience to hear or see you there. Oh, well, I thought you were going to get into it. Yeah. So, it's good. 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 It's um, and to make my submissions. Um, I'm here obviously to represent my constituents who feel very strongly about this application and my views are, uh, my, my purpose is to express the strong feeling of those who I represent. And I just wanted to start by highlighting, of course, uh, the need for renewable energy overall. Uh, that is recognised by me, uh, by the government, and indeed by my constituents. But the question that uh, we are considering today, the particular application uh, which uh, I oppose, um, and the reason for that, as you will know, is that this application impacts at least six villages in my constituency, Iceland, Snell, Well, Chippen, and Kennet, Gordon, and Burwell. And the residents of those uh, villages, uh, and would be broader than that, oppose this. And you can see that uh, from a statutory, uh, a, a, a consultation response um, that some of the villagers carried out very early on in this application. So, Chippenham Parish Council reported on a survey that they had done that 92% of residents in Chippenham were opposed to the project, and in Iceland, the figure was 84%. Mm -hmm. um, although in the same survey, um, the respondents recognized an approval rate for renewables as a whole of 93% and 92%, respectively. So what is proposed uh, by my constituents uh, is uh, this project and specifically the scale of this project, which is spanning out across two constituencies and a number of villages. So just talking about uh, the scale, uh, one of the criteria is, of course, landscape and amenity. There's 2,424 acres. It will become the largest in Europe, multiple size, times the size of any other existing or planned solar farm in the UK. And it's a, it's because of this, the sheer size and poor design by the applicant, which mean that the infrastructure will effectively enclose these neighbourhoods in my uh, constituency. And this has many implications for residents, uh, not just uh, once the solar farm has been built, if it is built, but during the construction phase as well, it will involve the depletion of our countryside, the loss of visual immunity, and significant disruption on local highways. Um, another criteria uh, that was mentioned uh, was land use. And I want to touch on the fact that this is largely on farmland and uh, it's well documented 
uh, that the constituency as a whole and this area is growing good quality crops, including wheat and root vegetables. And I understand from some local farmers and from agricultural specialists that a substantial proportion of the soil on the sites chosen by Seneca is best the most fertile quality, which the government suggests in its energy security strategy should be avoided or mitigated where possible in the interest of food security. And my constituents have expressed concern about the assessments that Seneca has made about the quality of this land throughout this process, and um, also the fact that access to the site for additional pests has not been forthcoming. And I really do hope that this is something that is considered further by the examining authority during the examination. And the third matter I'd like to draw a mention is about batteries. I'd like to raise my concern on behalf of my constituents at the excessive Accidental accident potential is being considered so close to residences in my constituency. Uh, and I will, in due course, the examining authority to seriously consider the safety risks given the proximity uh, to houses. I just wanted to finally touch on one thing, which is about the consultation process itself, um, because I have been really disappointed, and I know that my neighboring MP at Hancock has also been disappointed. By the regard shown by the applicant for my constituents. This is a project of some magnitude that is going to affect a number of villages. And the impact on those residents is significant and they should be listened to and uh, reliably informed. And there have been a number of points at which Seneca could have engaged with them and engaged properly, most recently in July, uh, when the uh, and, and earlier than that, when I held a public meeting and invited them to come and they did not. But in July, we, the applicant called for an examination to commence, even though their proposed changes to the scheme were not due to be clarified until the 30th of August. And many of my constituents have reported a consistently poor standard of communication from the applicant during the process, in terms of information access, webinar quality, and the short notice for consultation deadlines as a result of the applicant's changeable agenda. So uh, hopefully the district council finds uh, this information useful and in any of those points we've touched on, I don't want to today stress the strength of feeling across those villages about this application, in particular its size and its scale. So thank you very much for the opportunity for making those submissions today. You just where you where you are as members questions to Ms. Raider. Ms. So, any questions? Uh, well, failing that, I just like did I hear correctly that you had a, a public meeting and you invited the applicant to make different attend? That's correct. Right. And, and you have good information that the uh, a lot of the land involved is. Uh, was a better quality or described as better quality. So, so I know that um, the Sonic Action Group have carried out checks uh, using experts, and it is yeah. their assessment that the uh, that the Sonic assessments of the quality of the land is incorrect, and uh, they believe that the quality is uh, of higher grade. But what is disappointing. Uh, is that some of them have not allowed access onto the land uh, to enable an independent verification of their assessment. Thank you very much. I believe uh, we can do it at the end. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Lucy. Um, I'm concerned about uh, the lack of communication. Am I right in thinking that uh, the resident would not have had the level of communication that you feel is appropriate if you hadn't called that meeting? Is this something that uh, we had to uh, initiate, create, because it wasn't forthcoming in the development? Uh, well, obviously, some of this application has um, gone through the pandemic when communication was web based. Uh, but with the communication that my constituents have um, identified as being those were uh, not very um, constructive 
meetings online. And then, of course, once the pandemic restrictions were lifted, there was an opportunity for face-to-face -face consultation. And uh, as a result of that, I and my neighbouring MP, Matt Hancock, called a public meeting um, in the first time it frames. Um, it, there was a significant motive, but about 200 residents were able to attend. Uh, we invited some of that they did not attend, and I don't believe that there's been significant face to face consultation between Sanica and Legor. Councillor Jones. Yeah, it's my put you on the spot a little bit, but also you have to set that side scale of the uh, development. Um, and well, I appreciate you're not a planning expert. Is there a, a level that you would consider? Be appropriate, and, you know, in terms of how spread out would it need to be before it would be considered acceptable? I'm afraid I can't answer that question. I'm commenting on the application as it is submitted, and I can only comment on an application that is submitted. And this application, as submitted, we don't believe that the scale is appropriate. Um, but um, and the area that's true to the beginning of the so many villages uh, is appropriate to the way it's being designed. Any other questions? No, well, in which case, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, if you'd you like to turn the mic off, and uh, that's not you. my technical capability. So, the media development is a technical. You are welcome to stay, but I believe you have a busy schedule ahead of you. So, we thank you for coming and. See you again. Thank you very much, Council. We now have um, we now have five speakers who have objected, and I'm inviting them to come to the table as a group. And I believe this is I uh, have sorted your speaking time out between you, and very roughly you'll have about three minutes each. So um, Gary Chapman, Professor Gordon, uh, Chris Gordon. Ah. John James, something like If you can come onto the table, please. Um, I don't know what's happened with your microphone here, but it should be on when you're not. Um, and then we'll see if you can do it. So put on that. That's a good one, yeah. You're you need to be addressing the members which are here, and uh, it would be possible for you to have your presentation to the new end that you could have done if they took one. So, uh, I, I, I would suggest that Gary Chapman the speak first. <laughs> okay, I want to speak to you, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Gary Chapman. I live at uh, Thunderbolt Farm, which is in Boards Road in Bell. The technical detail has been covered, thank you. Um, I just want to say on behalf of my wife and I how worried we are with the large high voltage cable going through, going through our paddock. We've been shown the viewpoints, again, thank you, for now, for in the future, for, for up to 15 years. But can I say we've got uh, two um, farms close to us? One in, one in construction at the minute, one completed. And on the completed one, which was done three or four years ago, my wife and I have been fighting just to get the uh, hedging um, completed all the promise. It was shown in lovely literature and break it uh, an idyllic setting. But thank you. Now, four or five years on, we've not been done. So, yes, we do have concerns about this. Um, and for Sonica, when we put these concerns to them, we just met with the legal charge of apartment, paperwork, emails, letters, telephone calls, and visits in an attempt to get us to sign over a uh, commission to sign over our land. And the threats of compulsory purchase from my wife and I are, are upset. So, if this, all I would ask to the members is if this scheme is worthwhile, if it is appropriate, and it, if it is acceptable. Then my wife and I, we just question why there is so much anger against it and why the agents of Sanica carry on in what appears to us to be a seemingly aggressive and active. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, we will, I will give uh, members the opportunity to question you when you've all been so you can list it where you are. And uh, we now move on to the better report. Wasn't the original plan. Um, I think uh, some of these are sort of promoted the environment is set. I've got through to genuine. I've never actually been a professor. Um, <laughs> but um, I, 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 it's not my mission to protect the I would want to. Uh, I don't wish to be playing titles I don't have. Um, energy trading plant based upon giant batteries that has to have some ancillary solar panels which will deliver something that looks impressive in color and will slow to its revolt in winter because this is cloudy in England and uh, it's dark in winter. Uh, and I think that's more or less been confirmed uh, as we heard from uh, Mr. Phillips, the batteries will operate all year round uh, and they must therefore be central to the business model of anybody who operates this scheme. And yet, the batteries remain to this day totally unspecified as to the time, even the extent. Uh, all we did can know about them is that we can do them some estimates uh, that would put them certainly up there with the largest in the world, could be the largest in the country, probably the largest in Europe. We've only had figures for the energy storage capacity on Tuesday. Um, and so the trouble is that the batteries are the central industrial hazard that this scheme presents to the public safety and to the environment if there were to be a major accident in the batteries. And so it's um, effectively, it's a kind of outline planning consent at industrial scale, where we say we'll deal with the details of the batteries later on down the line. But that is to prejudge what I would call the process safety engineering of the battery installations, of whether it is possible to operate a lithium ion battery uh, storage systems at this step or in proximity to population centers and uh, sites, sites of special scientific interest and so on. Uh, at all, that process safety engineering, I don't believe it's been done. It's certainly not part of the um, application that's been put up to the examining authority. And I think, as such, it's really an abuse of the planning process. It's not like giving outline planning consent for a housing estate of 100 houses, and we can sort out the details later on at the, uh, at the second stage uh, planning level because we already know how to build houses. We know how to put them and uh, they can be made safe, we've got building regulations to enforce them and so on. But what have we got here? We're off the applicants asking for outline planning consent, but we'll sort out the details later. And it hasn't really been done fully satisfactorily anywhere in the world. And so I think on those grounds alone, uh, the application should be proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Chris Wall. I'm chairman of the New Market Traders Heath Committee, and as such, I'm tasked with protecting the integrity and the heritage of the gallops, taking what is best from the past and melding it with modern practices to maintain the Jockey Club run gallops as a world class facility so that we remain a preeminent training centre in not just British racing but throughout the world. I therefore speak for all 75 racehorse trainers in Newmarket and Exning in defence of the ongoing success of their livelihoods. Racing has been vulnerable to and under threat from foreign competition for many years, but our main weapon of defence and the reason we have maintained our elite status is due to our heritage. If we lose that we call it setting, we lose our shop window. This is our unique selling point and we need to preserve it. The lime kilns are our best gallops, Played throughout the world and spoken of wherever horsemen meet in revered tones. To lose the rural backdrop to these would be a serious setback to our industry and would seriously damage our reputation, thus ruining our hard earned premier status. Horse racing is now a global industry and new market is at the very heart of the training set par excellence for preparing elite equine athletes. 
is also a globally recognised centre of the breeding industry, as well as the home of Tatford Auction House, who sell the cream of Europe's breeding produce every year. To compromise the success of these would be a complete and utter disaster for the town. The cumulative effect of the loss of agricultural land, develop, develop damage to the environment and nature, the stress on the village communities within the project where many of the rainy industry staff reside, and the industrialization of the backdrop to our work make this scheme highly undesirable. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so we now have John Jay. Good morning, Chair. My name is John James. I'm a director of the board of the New Market Stud Farm Association. And my main concern is that we haven't been consulted before regarding the effects it's going to have on, on stud farms. Myself, um, Brookside Studies in Birmingham, and I, I have panels going on both sides of my land, right up to the boundary. Um, I've never been consulted, I've never been asked. Whether it would affect my business, I would affect me personally. They decided to put the footpath along half a mile of my boundary edge, where I have mares and bulls on one side of the valley, and then the public could just walk willingly as and when they want on the other side of the valley. Now, you know, we have found valuable mares coming from abroad, we have many kind of mares and bulls. Um, they're a flight animal, they've got very good eyesight, good hearing, and when a racehorse goes, it goes all past in the black and white arms. <laughs> you know, the dangers that, that we could have, plus the fact that it's going to affect our business. I was arrived and informed yesterday that none of the panels would go in the five hundred meters of a, of a house. Now, I measured my house this morning, the panel, and it's only from 25 yards. Um, it's not consideration. I, it's been very ill thought out without consulting us. If I go across the road from where I am, there's a battery site just to to get to be put there. And that's doubled in size since it was first noted. But they've never asked me how that was going to affect me. You know, from the mental point of view, I believe we're sat on a, a possible, you know, TNT explosion. If that goes wrong, we go up with it. And it, it's it's detrimental to, to my scope, my business, my family, my employees. But we've had no consultation with Sonica at all. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, then Nick and Bobby. So uh, good morning. My name is Nick Ryan. Thank you for listening to us this morning. Um, I'm a chartered surveyor farmer. I live at Baddingham Farm, Chippenham, less than a quarter of a mile from the summit of East Side B. Can I stress, I am not against solar energy or renewables. We have solar panels on the roofs of our farm buildings. We support solar in the right place. Good solar, not bad solar. Sunica is bad solar. The scheme has a huge cumulative impact on the larger area of the countryside. It will always quarrel with its rural surroundings and industrializing the area we live and work in. As a farmer, I would want to talk to you about agriculture. The Sunica industrial site is 2,424 acres, the equivalent of over 2,200 football pitches. It is the largest industrial solar site ever come to planning in the UK. It will take over two years to build, two years to decommission, making its lifespan at least 44 years. This cannot be regarded as a temporary loss. It is a loss for a generation, but in reality, it's probably forever. I have read the Sunica Agricultural Report and do not agree with its findings. It states that over 96% of the whole site is poor arable land graded 3B and 4. Briefly, grade 3B land is capable of producing moderate yields of a narrow range of crops, and grade B land is land with severe limitations which significantly restrict the range of crops and or level of yields. Three independent soil experts have reviewed the Sunica report and all fundamentally disagree with their findings. The action group have asked Sunica and the landowners three times for access to the site and have been refused each time. Why are they refusing this access? You have all driven around this area and you will have seen fields of potatoes, onions, carrots, parsnips, sugar beet, rye, maize, malted barley, and milling wheat. 
This has proved to be badly needed. Based on yields from our farm, a farm the size of the Sonica site would generate over 33,000 tonnes of produce every year. In the UK, we now are only 61% self-sufficient in food and 54% self-sufficient in vegetables. Our population is due to increase to 77 million in 2050. The appalling war in Ukraine has illustrated how fragile world food suppliers are. We must not take valuable arable, arable land out of production. Solar in the right place is what we want. There is an estimated 617 acres of south-facing industrial root space in the UK. If solar panels were installed on half of these roofs, half of these roofs, this will provide 50% of the UK's electricity needs. East Cam's excellent report points out the many, many shortcomings of Sonica. And I, we have just given you a snapshot of what we've had to go through in trying to deal with these developers. I urge you to support the recommendation of your council and record your rejection. Thank you, Perry. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, gentlemen. Before I ask the members to give questions, you I just like to ask a question to Mr. James. Am I right in saying that you were not consulted? That's absolute fact that you were not consulted. The fault I had is circular going through the house, you know, they got my name on it. The last letter I had from them, they wanted to purchase from Columbia to widen the road. And on the details, we got my property down as unoccupied. And I just replied and said, under my section 106, I'm not allowed to sell any land, but separately. And that was that. And that's the only person who they've never asked me uh, about these animals. Uh, coming right up to my age on both sides, I've got half a mile on one side, 40 miles on the other side, and literally I go across the road with the battery there. Uh, it's just a nightmare for us. Thank you very much. Now, now, members, questions to any of these gentlemen, but I would like to say that your combined information would be very helpful and they're very uh, illuminating. Thank you for coming. Uh, who was first? I'm sorry, we don't have a list of your names. So I apologize that. So I would like to uh, ask for some clarification from our. Doctor, who's not a first fellow, has I And I was quite. You use the terminology made in ground. Now, for people who are, are not in, in the commodity business, perhaps, so they don't understand what you actually meant by uh, a trading card and the impact of the uh, success of that being based on batteries. That have not been specified. Is that is that a, a, a plausible yeah. question? Yeah, I, I, I understand your question. I think it's a very good one. Thank you for asking it. Uh, what I mean by trading farms is that if somebody is owning and operating a battery, they can buy electricity from the grid when there is a surplus under under at times of low demand, and they buy it at a low price. And then when it's at high price. Well, I they'll put it back again and they'll sell it at a high price and so they profit from it thereby. Um, so I think that that is the, the likely business model of somebody who's, who's operating a battery energy storage plant. Um, the whole problem is that with increasing penetration of renewable energy on the, uh, on the grid, um, you've got to take that when it comes. Um, which isn't necessarily when people want it. And that's one way the uh, that demand for storage has arisen. And of course, then it's a business opportunity for those who provide battery systems. And that's really what I'm going to buy a, uh, an energy trading from. Buy low, sell high. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I do understand. I I and um, I'm grateful for, for your reply. Uh, I think the link from the planning perspective is uh, the lack of specification in the batteries. That are going to be required in order to fulfill the yeah. alleged trading um, plot that you are suggesting that we could be part of. Yes, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, one of the very first questions I asked to Summit for up in 2019, which two and a half years ago, I there initial non statutory consultations in the in the village halls i said well can you give me um, an idea of the energy storage capacity of the batteries there and they never got an answer 
Um, I was told 500 megawatts. Now, the trouble is that's a power, not an energy. It's like saying that the um, you know the weight of the bus is 30 feet. It's it's a nonsensical <laughs> answer. Um, and it was only on Tuesday that we finally got indications uh, from the uh, the applicant that the uh, energy storage capacity of the batteries could be up to uh, 2,400 megawatt hours, which is actually pretty much in line with what I estimated privately on the basis of the land areas and the kind of capacities that you can get uh, in the um, uh, battery storage cabins, you know, the physical cabins that hold the battery. So that's what makes it something so very, very large. There, um, uh, there have been major explosions in battery that are just two megawatt hours. In 2019, there was such an explosion in, in, in Arizona. Um, we had in Liverpool in September 2020, we had um, a, a significant explosion in urban Liverpool. And the fire that took Merseyside Fire and Rescue, something like 56 hours on site, to, uh, to control. One of the battery cabins was uh, was completely destroyed. And I think that the size of that battery system, you see, was only um, something like 20 megawatt hours. So we're talking about 2,400 megawatt hours. These are colossal amounts of energy stored in one place, which um, I would say, you know, has a, a, a you know, which fundamental to my engineering integrity, if I'm a project engineer involved in these things. But these things would have to be safe. And I, uh, you know, I, we, we, there's a large catalogue of battery accidents now building up from around the world. And uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, quite a frightening prospect if there is something that really got uh, the big one out of control. So um, that's the kind, you know, they'd be so cool, they in small batteries, but the more energy you've got stored. The rate of damage that you could do if it gets loose and goes on the land. That's the source of my concern, and uh, that's what I, why I refer to process safety engineering. You know, can the industrial plant be made safe? Yes, it's a bit like a nuclear power station. Um, you know, but you can't be very, very careful. If I can interrupt you, the second is not too from the. Uh, <laughs> hello there. Yes, I understand. Uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a couple of queries on that. I mean, just picking up on one of your points. Um, I'm getting it maybe slightly out of your remit, but uh, I mean, you're talking in such a large area. Would it be defensively strategic as a, as a point to, to take out? I'm not in a wider context, and that's probably a little bit out of the remit of this one, but if, you know, if you're going to take something out. If you were going to release, but I'm going to say, yeah, I'm just saying, if it, yeah, it's probably too wide a conversation. I fell off that one. Oh, I was talking about defensively. I uh, okay, well, taking I, it out if you know what I mean, but that's I think I could only answer the way that Lucy Crater answered. Answer. You have any comment on the scheme that's been put forward? Right. If I go to my original question, I'll then just sort of come to anything. Is there any other alternatives to battery storage? Um, they take into hydrogen, electrolysis, things like that type of that are economic. Well, in the whole. There's a whole science and technology around energy storage. And yes, of course, there are, are, are and so on, but the, the billion dollars batteries are the ones that are sort of you know commercially ready uh, and available now. And I think that's uh, the fundamental to this that they've been put forward. I mean, you know, we, we used to have energy storage, of course, in the form of home heating, in the form of science storage heaters. Mm. That used to be um, something that was on the widespread. Years ago, and that's simply storing heat in a load. No, I appreciate that. No, no uh, chairman, probably wants just to limit it down to you. But no, that did just, um, and what were the other alternatives, however they may be? Are they much more, do they need a larger land to you know, more them? Are batteries more concise in their energy storage than others? So the only um, large scale energy storage. Um, system that I know of that I consider fully satisfactory is pump storage, where you have things like the inner pump storage scheme in um, San uh where you literally pump water up to the top of the hill and then you let it run down again. 
Um, and that can be for very large amounts of energy. And obviously, it needs the kind of location that makes it possible. Um, the number of such sites, of course, is limited. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure Thank you. I was initially going to ask something about the battery story, but I think you're asked it. So I'd like to ask Mr. Jackman a question if I could. Um, I believe you mentioned that um, you've been threatened with, with compulsory purchase ordering on your paddocks for the cable to go through. And um, given, like, I know where you live, how close would that be to actually your home? And are you sort of in the high voltage of it? And, and we've had a few um, sort of cable bars locally recently. Um, are you sort of very worried about it? Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, my wife and I are very worried about it. I mean, we looked up and read uh, about the effects of cables in the ground, what it does, what it can do. Um, and we have asked those questions and put them the same thing. And as I think seems to be the general opinion, what we get back is it's not what the question answers to the question that you raise. Uh, in regards to compulsory purchase, um, yes, we we have been threatened basically that well, if you don't sign, then there will compulsory purchase. And one of our neighbors has actually under that threat did sign that they could. Um, for me, I haven't I've gone down that Englishman's owns his castle type of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, the, the concerns that we have just as a couple running a, a, a small home are such that we don't seem to be getting any support in respect to what the implications of this, of this scheme are. Um, and then when you extend it to a much larger and broader area, I think, well, if we're getting nothing back, then they must be getting even less of that. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you. This question going back to the engineering aspect. Um, would it be fair to say that technology in this sphere is moving on at such a rate that what you believe you are signing up to or accepting or is arranged? Couple of years down the line, you might find that what you get is something quite different. I think I'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much indeed. I've just got one, and now I think that I'll take that too. Uh, and my question is is to Mr. Ryan. Uh, did I understand it that you told me? And I guess you can't be precise because seasons vary. But there would be lots of 33,000 tons of produce of that area. What I did was I took um, local yields that we know about from local farmers <coughs> on a standard eight year rotation, which is what we all farm to, and 2,424 acres would generate in excess of 33,000 tons of bread. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And Gentlemen, thank you for coming along. You've been, uh, it's been very helpful, and I'm sure the other members have taken account of what you've said and, and appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, Paul Kelly and Lou Murray on the half day and uh, and uh, Luke Murray is one of the project guys. We need to turn your microphones on. How's that? Good. Good. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Dan, members, officers, for inviting Paul Kelly and myself, Luke Murray, one of the directors of Summit Limited, to meeting today giving us the chance uh, to speak with you and to answer your questions on behalf of um we're going to start by talking about the need the need for renewable energy projects such as the Sunica energy farm is clear it's noted within appendix one of the officer's report which cite the council in principle support renewable energy schemes through local plan policy ENV6. <clears throat> Alongside this, 
National Planning and Energy Policy sets out the urgent need for renewable energy development in order to address the significant challenges posed by climate change. The UK has an obligation in law to achieve net zero by 2050, which if we are to achieve, requires significant change in how we produce energy. This is a huge challenge. A scheme of this scale is being proposed in order to help meet it. If consented, this scheme will make a nationally significant contribution to meeting the need for secure, affordable, renewable energy. The scheme has significant benefits in terms of the renew renewable energy which it would generate. Our assessment shows that more than 950,000 additional tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent would be emitted to generate the same amount of energy as Sunica if it was not built based upon the projected grid energy mix. The need for schemes such as this one is only furthered by the recent threats to the security of the nation's energy supply. New domestic forms of energy generation will help keep such security and linked to security of supply is the need for affordable energy sources. And solar PV is an affordable and efficient method of generating electricity that is proven in the UK. Solar power, both ground and roof mounted, has the potential yeah. to exercise downward pressure on electricity prices as new developments come online. Although the final decision as to whether the scheme should proceed will be made by the Secretary of State, not by this council, the development consent for the process guarantees an important role for the council and other host authorities. The detailed design, construction and operation of the scheme will be in accordance with a suite of detailed design and management plans to be approved by the host authorities. This will be secured by the requirements of the DCO. We are extremely grateful to the council and the other host authorities for their engagement to date. This engagement has helped to create a better scheme. The design that we have arrived at through the environmental impact assessment scoping and two rounds of consultation provides enhancement to biodiversity and embeds planting and setbacks to minimize <coughs> environmental impacts. As members will likely be aware, this is a time-limited scheme that would operate for up to 40 years before being decommissioned and the land restored. This would be a requirement of our development consent. <clears throat> I would like to respond to the key points made in the draft written representation included in Appendix 1 of the Office Report. I must note, in summary, we do not agree with the removal of the panelled areas justified on this project. Such changes would eliminate a vast amount of the scheme's energy generating potential. And we respectfully disagree with the conclusion that the scheme is not compliant with parts 4.5 and 5.9.8 of the overarching policy statement for energy EN1. The scheme has been carefully cited and designed to minimize impacts. It provides substantial standoffs from settlements, minimizes the height of components used, and locates elements within the existing features of the landscape. The proposal provide for landscape and ecology management, which would enhance green infrastructure and provide screening to minimize visual impacts. With reference to tree removal, the scheme will avoid this other than where it is absolutely necessary. To ensure that this work is carried out appropriately, we have prepared a precautionary agricultural method statement to ensure any works to trees are appropriately undertaken. The scheme as a whole will result in new tree and new woodland planting. This approach is compliant with 
2.51.5 of the draft national policy statement for renewable energy infrastructure, EN3, and with the requirements of the overarching national policy statement for energy, EN1, both of which are, are cited within the council draft written representation. The effects of the scheme on biodiversity have been assessed extensively. Our assessments show that when built and operational, the scheme would result in a significant biodiversity net gain. Our assessment has indicated that the scheme would result in a minor adverse effect onto the setting of the historic park and garden of Chippenham Hall. This effect would be reversed when the scheme is decommissioned at the conclusion of its operating life. And this represents less than substantial harm. The draft written representation is incorrect in its statement that the scheme would result in substantial harm to this heritage asset. We have voluntarily limited the scheme's operating life to 40 years. There is no requirement in national policy for an applicant to justify the lifespan of a solar farm being longer than 25 years. Decommissioning the scheme at 25 years would not be an efficient use of resources, as this would be 15 years before the end of the scheme's design life and five years before the end of the warranty period for the solar PV. Early decommissioning would, again, serve to limit the volume of renewable energy that the scheme could generate. <clears throat> we take safety extremely seriously. The battery storage element of the scheme would be constructed and operated in accordance with a battery fire safety management plan. The detail within this plan has been prepared in consultation with the local fire authorities. An outline version of this plan on one of our application documents and the approval of a detailed plan is a requirement of the DCO, the development consent. We disagree, we disagree that a further assessment of agricultural land quality is required. We have submitted an agricultural land classification report that has been prepared by an independent consultant called Daniel Baird Soil Consultancy Limited, who is an appropriately qualified and experienced independent professional. And this report has identified that 94% of the solar farm sites do not comprise best and most versatile lands. We therefore contest the view that the impacts on the local area's wider economy have not been assessed. We have assessed the impacts of the scheme on the economy and the local area in accordance with the environmental impact assessment scoping opinion that was agreed before the submission of our DCO application. The scheme would generate a large number of jobs during construction and would be undertaken in accordance with a skills, supply chain, and employment plan that will be approved by the host authorities prior to the start of construction. We have and will continue to engage with officers at the host authorities to maximize the scheme's economic benefits. In summary, it is our view that on balance, the local and national benefits of the scheme outweigh its adverse impacts when considered against specific policy tests. While it has not been possible to avoid all impacts, these have been minimized where possible through careful design and detailed mitigation strategy. The scheme as proposed will generate a large volume of renewable energy for the national electricity grid, helping the national push to net zero and adding resilience to our national energy supply. We ask members to note these points when considering the council's response to the examining authority. If the scheme is approved, 
we will continue to work with the council throughout the scheme's construction and operating life through to the commissioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard Kelly. Do you address that report or would you want to say? Uh, no, I'm here to support you. I mean, there are a couple of points about the consultation for race. Uh, everyone, I was very happy to address either of this mistake or I had a question. If you've got a case that I can make to clarify the situation, please do it now. Well, I will, because I can see that the issue of the consultation was raised uh, around this table. And actually, the clear point is, I want to refer to some facts on the back of this, which is that there were 756 uh, responses. Uh, of which 705 actually came from local people uh, to this particular submission on the statutory consultation point. It's also fair to say that that statutory consultation had to be run during the process of, of the COVID limitations that were actually at the time. And I would like to thank Andrew Phillips and his colleagues uh, on the various other uh, planning uh, councils who have participated in this to help us try to design a consultation that would work given the very difficult set of circumstances that the whole country is not going to have the It's also a very difficult that under the, you know, with the state of the community consultation, that is a legal document. So everything that we put into that, we had to ensure that we could deliver. We couldn't put points into that document that could not be delivered because that would be one of the reasons we put that out. And at the end of the day, the statutory consultation process itself was seen to be fit or adequate fit for purpose when it was put through. So it's just not simply correct to say that the statutory consultation is not happening correctly. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm going to move on now. That's uh, we, we're considering that's the presentation from the applicants, and I'm now going to go into questions to them. So, Councillor Anderson, if you'd like to address the question, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your report. We can't do the consultation and get it up on first. I think it's a good question. You said 756. Is that the East Towns or is that across the whole? The that, that was across. So, at the end of the day, this, some of you may remember this. <laughs> it will bear in mind the situation that we were doing. It was sent to over 10,000 addresses in that area that we did consultation area. So that was one of them. So it would have been from everybody from Korea. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Can we point with you, Mr. Murray? Uh, how much money uh, or how much in monetary terms has been set aside for compulsory purchase? I'm actually how many residents will that uh, Thank you, uh, Councillor Smith, for the question. Um, the um, the entire scheme within the red line boundary will be affected by the uh, compulsory acquisition powers as set out within the Planning Act. The rationale for this is that this is a scheme of naturally significant importance. Uh, we will and have been attempting to engage with voluntary agreements with each and every one of the landowners affected within the red line boundary of the scheme through multiple different methods through multiple years. Um, and uh, But in order to uh, ensure the deliverability of the scheme, the uh, development consent order will seek to have a uh, compulsory acquisition powers uh, as a backstop to make sure that this scheme of national importance will be deliverable. Very much important. Thank you very much. Thank you. How much of this North Country land do you actually own now, and how much of you of it, if you don't own it, have you got firm ability to actually purchase it? Uh, and uh, why is it so scattered across the place? Why would it not be better to put it all in one place? And uh, put the batteries right in the middle of it so that they're not uh, near any uh, village or habitation. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, the 
answer to your first question is that it's, been, it's not our intention to purchase any of the land uh, now or at any point in the future. Our intention is to lease the land. Um, we have uh, engaged with all of the landowners across the scheme, uh, have um, a significant number of agreements in place, and uh, are very well advanced with the uh, many of the other landowners. Uh, in terms of your second question, why did we not group the lands uh, in one place? Um, we undertook a uh, site assessment, uh, alternative site assessment, which engaged in understanding where there was suitable land uh, within a 15 kilometer radius of the point of connection here in Burwell. Uh, and that um, really guided the process as to where uh, what was suitable land available for developing solar projects. Unfortunately, given the nature of uh, the land in the area, that there wasn't a single contiguous block of land of sufficient size to house all of the solar in one location. Um, as to the location of the battery storage areas, uh, they are located um, close to the on-site substations in order to uh, minimize the distance of the voltage infrastructure and keep that cost to an absolute minimum. Uh, and so there are three on-site substations and that's the driver for the locations of the battery storage next to the on-site substations. I didn't. I don't think you've actually answered the question, but in mind, um, uh, if, if you're not intending to um, purchase any any of the land, but it only rent it out for four years, um, if you need it to, you could just reduce some of the fields that you know people that will cause most problems. So you could actually you know, use the size of it quite easily without causing any problem. With it. Is that right? Um. The purpose of the project is to uh, deliver emissions reductions. Um, we need to urgently move from where we are today um, to a position of net zero within the next 30 years. Uh, this project needs to address that urgent need uh, and it needs to be as big as it possibly can in order to as quickly as possible help us to progress towards that legally binding targets. So while, yes, we could take away fields all across uh, the scheme, that would then not deliver on a central reason why we're doing the scheme, which is to move the country as quickly as possible towards net zero. And solar does that. You know, unlike nuclear power, which might take a decade to permit, another decade if you can raise the financing to build, um, Solar power can be built very, very quickly. Uh, it then can be um, operated, and once it's run its useful operating life, you can simply pull it up, take it away, and recycle most of the parts, and the land is restored and can be used for agriculture again, rested for 40 years. Okay, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, previous speakers did raise some very worrying points. I'm totally um, behind um, the need for solar energy. Yesterday, with my colleagues, we travelled around and viewed um, some of the sites. And as a neighbour, I was really perplexed by some of the um, some of the sites that you have chosen. Is it that the substation in Burwell is the overwhelming driver to this? Or could this a similar scheme not be um, somewhere else in the country entirely where you might have more open land available? That's interesting. That's Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, Absolutely, I'm working on multiple other projects of a similar scale, even bigger. Um, my uh, my business partners are, are working on, on also multiple projects, and so are all of the the you know, it's the entire solar industry. The government targets um, 
is that we achieve net zero by 2050. To do that, we not only need all of the rooftops that were mentioned by the gentleman here, which would, by the way, if, uh, according to the Solar Energy UK, account for approximately 10 gigawatts total. In order to get to 70 gigawatts of capacity, we yeah. can only need this project, but many, many more like it. So um, um, we're constrained. And we were absolutely constrained by an electricity system that was built and designed to distribute centralized coal fired power stations. And what we're asking that electricity system to do is the opposite of what it was designed to do. And so, the, the, when you hear these government targets, the key constraint is not um, do we have sufficient sites, do we have sufficient uh, will to build them, it's do we have the uh, connection infrastructure to uh, connect those projects to the grid? And, and, and that is you know, the big um, issue in the, in the UK with renewables development at the moment. And that is why there are so many projects connecting into here to Burwell. And what's distinct about our projects, as opposed to all of the other solar projects that are connecting into Burwell, is one, one of the big factors that's distinct is that oh, they're genuinely on. 96% of non gas to most versatile land. Look at the location of these projects here that were permitted by this very district council, and um, many of them are located on 100% of most versatile land. Thank you. I don't feel I know enough about the subject to be able to pursue the um, conversation. I can't say that I'm fully satisfied with your answer, but we'll pass on. Thank you. Okay, Jane, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I just want to think. Carry on, carry on. Yeah. 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 Other schemes from the goes in our areas. Um, do you, are they around um, solar panels also? Uh, I've just uh, completed a transaction on a 250, 500 megawatt hour standalone battery storage scheme. At this update and just north of here um, at Warhorse and Peters. Are you looking at other alternatives like above ground solar panels? Because of with due to all these panels going in, where are we going to get food to you know to you know even if you find going to say grow the crops for feed or something? I think I think that is an excellent question, but I would refer you to some of the statistics that have been put forward by the solar energy UK body, which is the trade association that represents the solar industry. Um, and uh, you know, the, the level, in order to meet our objectives, uh, the level of farmland or agricultural land or any kind of land that would be needed uh, to achieve those 70 gigawatts it is on a par with the number of golf courses that we have in the UK. So um, uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, and that is why we focus on the ways of agricultural land. Um, and um, while food security is important, climate change, energy security, and cost of living are also deemed to be crises. We're in a we're in a, a bit of a hole at the moment in this country. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Some of my potentially conflict with Councillor Wilson did, but I mean, I think some of these um, uh, villages were felt were covered by it, um, the developments rather than sort of being spread out. Um, are you, uh, have you considered any other options? I mean, you said there's a 50 mile limit, and obviously that's, that's new, obviously, uh, your connection limit, um, but there, there could have been some more rural areas. Have you considered those? Or was there, is there a reason why you sort of centralised it around? Three villages rather than saying more linear development. Absolutely. Uh, so it's a 15 kilometer radius that we've looked at for the point of connection. Um, and we, we've worked that out in, in, a, in a lot of detail, and it is available to read within one of the sort of consent order submission documents, which is called the alternative site assessment. <laughs> Well, it was a capital rules and it was counter and it was counter. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to hand it off. Just for personal uh, interest, regarding riverbanks, 
Has uh, any of company looked at riverbanks at all? Thank you, Aldrich. But in this area, what's riverbanks? In, in what sense? What put in your bank? Um, I'm, I'm not a professional ecologist, but my understanding is that um, riverbanks are ecologically sensitive zones, and that's the reason why the environmental agency stipulates that we have to have special permission to construct within 10 or 15 meters of uh, green points. So the advice when uh, locating um, any infrastructure or routing, any cabling, uh, is to minimize the uh, interaction with sensitive ecological zones. Thank you. Then we have Camp Jones and then Camp School Wilton. Right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, obviously, much point has been made about the, uh, the battery safety. Uh, and I understand there's some new regulations coming online about um, those regulations um, within the impact report. Um, <laughs> One of the notes that I, you know we've got, uh, it seemed to be that sort of keeping the things cool. Um, the, the fire mentioned that Manchester was somewhere around that way before. Um, um, the um, the use about 9,000 litres of water. I know it's our particular one here had about 4,000 litres of capacity. Do we feel there's enough capacity built into the, the system, or is it uh, augmented or supplemented by fire engine and things like that? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, the, uh, the, from what I know, anecdotal, uh, anecdotally from uh, the Liverpool fire, um, the fire services haven't necessarily been properly briefed on the, the design of the scheme and to what their um, response would be. And they uh, used a lot of water and it's causing ongoing issues uh, as a result. Um, we have, uh, through our process, uh, consulted with fire services, we've engaged with um, fire safety experts, including on the subject of uh, fire water. The fire water would be used to keep. So, in the, the first instance, um, the scheme would be designed with equipment that's procured based on its uh, safety parameters. So, one of the key facts and figures um, that, that we're, we're looking at is that. I think 70% of all of the battery fires that we've experienced on the list today in the world relates to air-cooled systems. Um, you'll notice that um, vehicles such as Tesla now use liquid-cooled battery systems, um, and the number of accidents and fires related to liquid-cooled technologies uh, are 30% of those. So already, if you procure equipment, uh, and um, do widely you can reduce the number of your the, the, the potential that you have towards accidents. We're then looking at a uh, reason that we've adopted such large areas for the battery energy uh, storage systems is in order to be able to keep uh, significant separation distances between the containers. And that enables you to limit any uh, fire event or accident event to the specific container where the fire occurs. So that this is to counter the point of this case multiple times today that suggests that as you scale these schemes, so the scale of the risk increases, well, not true. If you have properly designed schemes and you have the, the, the right level of uh, separation distances between the containers, and we've stipulated one distance in the, um, the, the current outline battery fire safety management plan, but we will adhere to regulations as and when they come on board, then that stops the fire from propagating between containers. And it's that which dictates the level of water that you would use. So you have water, the fire services want water for the internal suppression system to keep the, the internal battery modules cool. Uh, and then uh, we have on site fire water available. For the external fire water suppression, uh, and we have sized that water based on a flow rate given to us by the fire services over a number of hours. And then we also allow for uh, abundance uh, setup such that the secondary fire water can run off into abundant lagoon that can be tested. This is a very question and answer. Well, I think it's answered. Yeah, yeah. The question is that it will work the intense work that we've done on battery safety because it's a key concern to your constituents. 
Of course. And then the, it's good to hear that this section is meant to be a question on the yeah. in addition to the sanctuary uh, sure. 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 Anyway, is there anything else you'd like to hear that we just find? No, I think that's it. That that Councillor Wills. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, we've been hearing about food security. Um, can you let me you know what sort of uh, food or crops are being grown? On the fields that you are suggesting that you put your panels on. I, when I looked, I have visited, not that it was part of the land, but I don't know whether it was all part of the land or whether there were the crops on, on some of these things. And did you take this into account? Um, we, uh, on the fields that uh, we, we uh, keep in regular contact with the uh, band farmers, um, often. Requesting from them uh, field by field cropping schedules uh, for the current future years, so that we're able to program works to be as minimally any any surveys or any intrusive works that be as minimally invasive as possible. There's a range of crops um, from wheat, sugar beets, potatoes, uh, carrots, onions um, on the fields. Um, uh, there are also um, animals, including pigs, uh, cows, uh, also on, on the fields. Um, energy uh, food security is a uh, you know something that's close to my heart. Um, in fact, my father worked for 30, 30 years for the World Food Program, so um, I'm uh, uh, very well aware of the problems around the world that relate to uh, food security. To follow up that, when, when you, if you take this mission and start putting these panels up, would you uh, encourage the owners of the actual land to carry on producing food by grazing sheep, for example? Or I, mean, I believe that can be done un under the uh, um, thing, I don't know about pigs, I feel like it might be a bit tall, but you know. What, what's uh, yes. the thing you're planning to do? Indeed, uh, the uh... The landowners will be uh, eligible to um, take a, uh, a sheep grazing license with the operation of the maintenance contractor for the scheme. Uh, if they don't choose to take that uh, license and, 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 uh, and, and graze the, the scheme, graze sheep on the scheme, uh, then the uh, operator the maintenance contractor gives a uh, point to another contractor to do that. Um, and that way, um, we will avoid uh, having to generate emissions through mechanical mowing um, and through pulse grazing around the site. So you actually positively, uh, you actually positively want sheep on, underneath your uh, things, aren't they? But only that there are you know, some carbon emissions related to uh, sheep as well. So um, you know, difficult to win. Um, thank you. Um, I can't say that I know the story much about it. So I've tried to learn to, to find out something about this morning. But that's really so far. Maybe I have missed um, the fire reports that you've got. It's on page 260. Uh, um, um, it's about how It says, the delivery of the fire and personal services. This is stuck with the vision. Because you've got to be the other county council in Cambridge and Peter by far away, which is good. Um, uh, but they're hard to find in fact of the battery, so I can't find anything yet. Or sufficient detail, including type and scale, being provided by the applicant. Instead, these points will narrowly consider the reasonable worst case scenario for an operator and firefighter point of view. Have I missed another? Um, I think you might have missed the outline battery fire safety management plan which was uh, developed in consultation with and approved by uh, both of the county uh, authorities. And you will, there will be a revised version of this and um, submitted uh, giving more detail on the 11th of November. So when was that? With the development consent order documents. No, no, when was the, the, the document I missed? With the development consent order documents. Okay, I don't want to get that. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, mentioned before, uh, mentioned uh, by the previous um, member of the London community um, about it uh, essentially being a trading um, organization, which it seemed quite um, feasible. And it's, it's that a core part of this? I mean, obviously, you said you don't want to lose any focus of egg cells and we produce energy. And, we appreciate that and we do need the green energy. Um, but obviously the size of it, as Lucy Fraser mentioned at the beginning, uh, is, is having great impact. Um, so is there an opportunity for it to be going kind of about photobare same cells and we look at more of a battery thing and a, and um uh, yeah, so you asked me the question in the wrong way. You were going to ask, is it is it economic if you took away the batteries, but you asked it vice versa? No, I think it's more of the battery to me. I can see it's going to be a story. If we had a battery storage and uh, some folks have got to take self, um, is that it's still a viable? Uh, the, the, the scheme, the, the battery storage is classed as associated development with the scheme, and it is. Um, uh, as a design is associated with development in the scheme. If you look at the proportions across the scheme, uh, we have roughly 31 hectares dedicated to battery storage, and we have nearly a thousand hectares dedicated to solar PV. So the solar PV is the core of this asset. What we're doing is we are uh, generating electricity in a way that will lower the uh, emissions level on the national grid. The battery storage enables an enhancement of that process um, by being able to store the electricity and, and use it at times uh, when it's most needed. And if you look at the level of battery storage that we will need in this country to get to the legally uh, mandated targets, it's nearly one to one. For every gigawatt of renewable electricity we will need, we will need a gigawatt of battery storage to get there. So we need this project and we need all of the others that are being planned and proposed at the moment. Follow that. Um, so um, obviously we need the battery storage. Um, you said it's an augmented part of the planning application. So in your experience, we need to likely get permission on its own. So I mean, I think that what the gentleman before was just suggesting that actually the it was um the, the, the solar park in itself is not irrelevant, but um uh it, it gained access to the factory development on this particular location. <laughs> if we wanted to just do the battery story on its own, we could permit that scheme through the Town and Country Planning Act uh, in 13 weeks. Um I did uh, a, a, a scheme of 250 megawatts, as I just explained, at, at the uh, substation, one substation north uh, of Burwell, <laughs> uh, it was permitted earlier in the year, it uh, received zero objections through the planning process, uh, and is adjacent to the substation. Uh, you would not locate battery storage uh, 20 kilometers from the substation if you were just going to do standalone battery storage, unless you were uh, a madman. Thank you. Now, very straight. <clears throat> we live in an uncertain world, and um, as our Ukrainian friends are finding, um, you know, it is very easy to blow up target um, utilities. Are you building in some sort of security um, to your batteries? Are you? Do you have in your mind to have? Some secure, some security around them. I mean, we have numerous terrorist organisations. Many of us in this room would have grown up and witnessed the IRA in their heyday. Um, you know, this this could become a problem. I can imagine that if the batteries were blown up, it could or the cargo because it could be catastrophic. It, it, indeed, indeed, it, it, we, we are living in uncertain terms. But if I were to put my shoes, myself in the shoes of Vladimir Putin, one of his agents, um, I would get hold of some Iranian drones and I would target them at the nuclear installations in this country. I would target them at the substations in this country. Uh, a bad day for a solar installation is a cloudy day. Uh, these installations are very safe. Um, they are you know, vulnerable potentially to attack, but they are modular in nature. 
um, and you would potentially just be able to turn off a particular inverter, uh, fix the strings that were associated with that in virtual the, the panels, um, and uh, when they were ready, put them back online. I think the other point to make on that, Councillor Andrew Smith, is also the fact you're absolutely right. I mean, you can see I'm getting on a bit in, in years, and in that time, it's quite interesting to see how people can actually weaponize energy. No doubt about that. And, and the impact that that is going to have, and therefore, from that point of view, this is another reason why the scheme, in our opinion, has to happen, mm -hmm. is because it actually provides the country with a greater level of security than it would have if we rely on all the time on force coming mm -hmm. into generate this electricity on all the force. So, Every megawatt hour of electricity we produce from solar is a megawatt hour less gas we need to produce uh, and purchase that. Some of that gas we put makes a very neat end shield. That's a big Thank you very much indeed. I think all the councillors have their questions going to <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next week. Uh, we've given us uh, quite a considerable understanding of what's going on. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, I, I'm looking at the time, I think it would be wise, we've got two node councils, and I think we'll, we'll go ahead with, uh, am I getting a, a comment from the councillor? Yeah. Oh, do you want to what, sit No, no, oh. I was going, going to go to the Lee Gods and Verbal Node Council. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I did have you down, Mr. Dodds, originally as a sort of in partnership with Chippenham and Harris County, but then I was very informed that you were sort of a separate presentation. Yes. You may want to sit at the end, which would allow members of the public to get a, a better hearing. Not possible when you're more than one. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Dodds, and I'm a member of the Thurwell Parish Council. Um, just to clarify my standing here, I haven't I've got a statement. I haven't had the opportunity to put it in front of the council to get that support. On the other hand, we have a climate emergency statement that will be consistent with what I'm about to say. And also, the parish council has made a formal uh, submission previously in an earlier consultation in support of the Sunday um, project. So you were saying you're not you're not speaking on behalf of that uh, council, but you are speaking as an objector, as a supporter, a supporter of the negative of the was supporter, uh, and uh, I think the best thing to do. So, let me just consider a bit of a bit of a understanding here. Yeah. 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 Okay, this is because it's rather confusing because we've got you down to let the verbal parish council. Well, they're aware that I'm here, and what I say will be consistent with their uh, on the record views. Um, but because I haven't actually had this endorsed, I'm kind of hesitant about saying, okay, yes. well, what, we, what we're going to do is you please make your presentation and then we'll accept that as a speech from a member of the public who lives in the Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. So I'd like to begin by saying you know, what a difficult issue this is because um, the District Council and Burwell Parish Council have climate emergency statements which take up an international view, top level view of the problems that we face um, with climate change. Then we have Sonica talking about the national targets and the national imperatives regarding infrastructure. 
And then we have the heartfelt objections of uh, constituents <laughs> who are directly impacted by the reality of this on the ground. And for the district council to pull that together into a, a, an endorsement or, um, or a rejection is difficult. It's very difficult to balance it. And I, I feel that way myself. But having thought about this uh, a lot, I, I do support for the project, and I'll just read my statement if I may. So we need to move quickly towards a low carbon economy. It's essential, but it will be difficult. It requires determination, focus, and compromise. And the aim should be to find ways for Sonica to go ahead, because now is not the time for seeking perfection. It's too late. I don't have the knowledge to go into all of the um, grounds for objection that have been raised with Sonica. So I'll just choose one of them, which is, I think, the food security um, issue. Whilst legitimate, has been exaggerated. And I took the trouble to check with DEFRA, the amount of arable land in the east of England. And if you, if this is principally Cambridgeshire, Suffolk, Essex, and Norfolk, and it's 1.1 million hectares. Now that uh, is roughly slightly more than half. Of slightly a bit over half of that is given to the primary crops for barley, wheat, or the seed grain. So that would you could call that prime, if you like. If we then express that as a percentage of the percentage of area of sun, which is 1,100 uh, 1, hectares at the upper range, there are various estimates, then it will take 0.1% of the percent of the east of England's arable land. So it's, yes, it's something, but it, it, it's not, as you would perhaps believe if you read the press, great swathes of our land being taken to so land. And subjectively, I think that's what I see driving around in Spandia. You see crops everywhere. Solar is the exception. And I think that obviously needs to change, but I'm seeking to reassure people that we are not losing huge amounts of our land yet. It may come to that, but at the moment we are we're on we haven't reached that point. So, so it's understandable there are there are angry voices raised in opposition to huge infrastructure projects. If it were an oil refinery or a nuclear power station, there would be just as much, if not more, opposition. <laughs> and those concerns from residents and mm -hmm. businesses have to be taken seriously. And wherever possible, accommodations need to be found. But I would like to urge the District Council to shape their response so that they may wish to see that they wish to see the plans improved. They also wish to see the project approved because in relation the climate emergency that we're facing, we have to have now. We can't just put this to one side and imagine another project will come along that we can improve later. Decades can go by because we know with infrastructure approval. This one is much closer to maturity than others, which are still just on the drawing board. So I hope the council to give us a positive response. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillips. Uh, members, uh, you, you'll appreciate that you definitely had before Mr. Bell spoke. He, uh, he was on the business as being the representative of the Paris Council, that is not the case. He is a resident of the top third world. Uh, you listen to what he's got to say. Yeah. Now, do you have any questions to put to it? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And, uh, We've now got Fiona Maxwell, uh, and just to, just to check my bit of trees, you are representing uh, the Chair. Are you the chair? Yes. You are the chair. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, you're sitting in the right seat, so then. Okay. <laughs> Where you go? 
Yes, I'm Fiona Maxwell. I am indeed chairman of the Children and Parent Council. And I also chair the Parent and Town Councils Alliance, which represents around about 12 parish and town councils um, within the Sonica affected site. And um, it's striking <clears throat> that all of the town parishes directly affected by this team, all of those it. This is not opposition to so that, excuse me. Not up to the cellular, but it is competent. Thank you, thank you. Um, it is opposition to this scheme. In its efforts to create a scheme big enough to qualify for a DCO, so it has identified several very spread out sites. This has the effect of encircling our villages with an industrial power plant. The cumulative impact is serious and detrimental to our villages, our surroundings, and to our residents. The spread out scheme has not evolved in a way sympathetic to our environment or even taking account of it, but simply where Seneca had found landowners close enough to the grid who were willing to allow the use of their land. Most of our villages surveyed their residents. You've heard about these surveys, I think, but and you've heard that the results in Chippenham show that at least 90% of the residents were pro renewables, but the same 90% were also against Seneca's scheme. Um, results in the other villages that had surveys were strikingly similar. This scheme is not a temporary loss of land and annuity. With an estimated three to five years of construct and a 40 year lifespan, and who knows how long it takes to be committed, this is a lifetime project. The land and the landscape will never be returned to how it is today. Productive farmland in a unique landscape. We have been told that the farmland is not best and most versatile by an applicant that has refused to allow any corroboration of this. But if you live and work around here, you will know that this is extremely productive farmland producing a variety of crops. With an increasing focus on food security, this is surely not the time to be covering our fields with solar panels and battery installations. Site visits, which are still ongoing, one this afternoon yet, with the examining, examining authority and Seneca have underlined that many of the roads required for construction are unfit for this purpose, too narrow and winding, and then using roads through the villages. We'd also like to clarify this point that we came up earlier. Um, the estimated 200,000 homes that would be supplied with electricity by this would not be local. And there is a feeling amongst some local people that oh, we're going to get this electricity, we're not, it will go into the grid. Others have spoken about the many aspects of this scheme which are unacceptable the safety of the lithium ion batteries, the loss of productive agricultural land, the detrimental effect on the landscape, the damage to biodiversity, and the permanent loss of the connectedness of our villages. It's sort of more and more like the manufactured production and transportation, construction, running, and decommissioning of these sites will not contribute to the net zero targets. There are further concerns about the source of photovoltaic panels and other equipment limited in China, and much of which allegedly is produced by Uyghur slave, slave labor. From the point of view of Chippenham, we have a major concern about the view from the Lime Kills and Waterfall Farm, which is in our parish. Uh, that was talked about earlier by representing racing. It will have an impact on the racing industry, and that will have an impact on our village and our local villages because so many people are involved in the business. And um, something else touched on Chippenham Park Estate being listed and the historical importance. So we also have concern about that. This scheme will transform a rural and agricultural environment which has existed and evolved over the thousand years, going back to the doomsday book of some of our villages, and they will be transformed into an industrial estate. I want to emphasize the overwhelming view of residents from all of the affected villages that this is bad summer. The prospect has caused uncertainty and misery. If we allow seeing this bad, a precedent will be set and other communities will be blighted by similar schemes. And just as I've been asked, um, Anne Noble, who is registered to speak at this event, I don't think so. 
Um, it's only in the tent. Um, and I've been asked to read the following contribution from her. It's very short. And I actually don't understand it. <laughs> if you look at the industry figures for the amount of land needed to provide one megawatt, most talk of around two hectares with a few lower estimates to produce a megawatt. However, that fully includes some ancillary equipment. It's reasonable to take a figure of one hectare per one megawatt. So they can have 588 hectares of land, which suggests that they cannot produce the 23.5 terawatt hours per claim. I think the professor doctor. I'm not going to know what any of that meant, but I'm afraid I'm really, really happy to get the five minutes. Never come across with a, a letter being introduced for an extension at that time. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the point is well made, and the, the points the you put, put up in front of us are, are very valid. Uh, now, what we would like to do is the members' questions. That's the Thank you, Chair. Um, can I uh, pick up one point? You said about permanent loss of connectivity and mobility. What do you mean by that? I mean that um, it, we have settlements um, and they do go back for centuries, uh, many centuries. And there are routes between them. So between Chippenham and Sailwell and Chippenham and Islam and Islam and Fordham and so on. And a lot of what this scheme will do will be to interrupt the, the flow, if you like, of that traffic, which is often now done by car. Um, but it's still done by foot. Lots of people, we walked yesterday on a site visit down the side of the River Lark, I believe, from Duke's Ferry. You know, and there was quite a lot of joking about how it's quite dodgy late at night in the dark after the nights when you're walking back to Iceland from Duke's Ferry because it's a, yeah. it's a 40 minute walk from there. And um, Duke's Ferry, I believe, is north of Wollings and West. Yeah, I'm just making the point about people to. I think I think it's very What I was going to get at was there's no, uh, is there any official loss of any um, uh, public rights away or anything like that? Um, with this development that you know of, but I, I know they're being discussed. I couldn't pinpoint any that have been lost. Yeah, go back to that. Yeah, Councillor Edwards. Not intentionally. We're back to the statutory consultation because when you get in a big concern, uh, which suggests that actually the majority are in favour. Where your your public trust, the work that you did was so is that able to be fed into these statutory consultations? Because obviously, you know, you're we hear two stories, one on one side, you know, oh, it's really, really good. And, and you're saying that actually this could be because we've done our local surveys and it's not We did, yeah, we did um, <laughs> a local survey. Um, those results were fed into our um, villages, our parishes, which is the party representation, which went to Seneca and to the Examining Authority. Right, so you were able to. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, in terms of any further consultation, I said there was an open meeting that said a couple of months didn't come. Was, was that on your, your patch? With your that, was in, that was held in Iceland. Yeah. Um, it was an a open consultation for anybody. Um, they just they were a lovely big um, so it was held there, and um, the hall was full. Lots of people came from all over the district, um, and uh, but some didn't. Yeah. So okay. they do. David I told you you're asking for permission to speak. No, no, no. Yes. Sorry. My, my source of information is yeah. undeniable. Uh, any other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have, uh, I'm looking at the time, but I think it would be uh, while we're here, 
I, I, unless anybody's got any urgent needs to break for lunch now, I'm, I'm tend to have a uh, just make a statement with Councillor David Brown and uh, move on to Councillor Julia Hopper. So there's, there's a statement from Councillor David Brown. He's just wanting to place on record his agreement with the officer before objecting to the summit of project. So he's not here, but he, he is a local councillor and he would be agreed with the opinion of the officer. So now uh, it's Councillor Hopper. And again, I'm suggesting you might want to sit at the end of the table and go to the meeting. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Firstly, let me say I and the communities I represent are in favour of solar power. However, this scheme, if approved, will devastate the area that we love and live in. This area of the country is famous the world over for its vast flat fields of wonderful produce from salad leaves and peat root, grain and root vegetables of all kinds. The headquarters of racing is located in Newmarket, where 3,000 horses live and train bringing employment and supporting industries to the area. The visual impact of this application cannot be underestimated. The unique nature of the fence is that of fields of crops spreading as far as the eye can see, like the prairies of the Midwest. It has a beauty not all appreciate, but it's part of the nature of the area we live in. The urbanization and industrialization that 1,600 acres of solar panels will bring cannot be hidden behind hedges. That would take 15 years to establish in order to hide them. The insertion of hedges where they don't belong is unacceptable. The sheer scale of the application will change the principle of open farmland that we enjoy. Many of us have chosen to live in the countryside because we love the open fields and lack of organization. Allowing this to go forward will destroy an aspect of our lives that we take for granted, we'll take it and destroy it forever. The battery storage units are not in keeping with the nature of the area. Farm buildings are more organic and smaller in scale than what is being proposed here. These units would be more at home on an industrial park, not in open countryside. They would be impossible to hide and visible for miles. The impact on beautiful buildings such as the Ark in Iceland and many other iconic buildings such as churches and areas of outstanding natural beauty, Chippenham Park and the Lion Hills will be devastating. The applicant is suggesting that biodiversity will be improved by in providing biodiversity corridors. Unfortunately, wildlife don't know what a biodiversity corridor is. Deer, monk jack, hares, and rabbits, voles, and all manner of bird life are used to being able to roam free, freely over the acres that will become a fenced, industrial, artificial, manicured area. What those who don't know better would call a biodiverse corridor what I call an abomination. As a civilized society, we should live in harmony with nature, not tell nature how to behave. We should respect the balance of agriculture and wildlife that has worked for generations. Anyone who has watched here stream over open fields would understand that. I stood yesterday and watched as flocks of geese who majestically over the open fields that could soon be filled with solar panels and wondered how many of those would die as a result of attempting to land on the water like appearance of a field of solar panels. We live in an area that is rich in arche archaeological history, much of which, in which has yet been discovered, would potentially be lost forever. The attitude of the applicant is that potential finds will not be lost, but maybe hidden under concrete panels. Then in 40 years' time can be re removed and returned to farmland once more. How naive do they think we are? The panels will not last 40 years, at most maybe 25 by which time I would expect a further application to be made to continue the process. Let's not be under any illusion. If this scheme goes ahead, this land will be lost forever. Land which currently produces a huge range of crops as potatoes, main crop and salad, parsnips, onions, carrots, sugar beet, rye, barley, main crop and animal feed, wheat and main crop and animal feed. The applicant would have you believe that the land is poor quality, However, no farmer will invest in irrigating poor soil. Every acre of the scheme is high productive quality land with irrigation, producing a wide range of produce that we need to feed ourselves and the livestock we rely on for milk and meat. Poor arable land would not produce 33,000 tons of produce as does the land on neighboring farms. 
The report on the quality of soil submitted by the applicant is poorly prepared and technically lacking, and numerous requests to access the affected areas to take samples have been denied. But they have nothing to fear and nothing to hide, why would they deny access? The applicant is proposing 77 acres of lithium ion battery storage. Should these batteries catch fire, as has happened in the United States and Australia, they cannot be put out in a traditional way. They have to burn themselves out, releasing toxic fumes if they do so. Evacuation of large areas is a distinct possibility, and a closed window policy for thousands of households are up to be inevitable. How it would affect lifestyle, low wildlife is unclear, but you can imagine the devastation that could be caused over a vast area. The predicted battery storage capacity is far greater than is will be needed for the storage of electricity produced by solar panels. The future operator, because they will be operating it, they're selling this, will be buying um, from the national grid when demand is low and, and cheap and selling it back when demand is high and expensive. The pretense that this is a green initiative is exposed. This is only about making money. And the knowledge that this will take at least 40 years to become carbon neutral makes a mockery of the efforts of so many of us to try and reduce our carbon footprint. The increase in vehicle movements on what the county council have said on many occasions are quiet fee roads will be catastrophic. A conservative estimate that is that during the two years of construction, an additional 3,000 vehicle movements, many of them HGVs, on country roads used by school children walking to school. Why at a time when we were trying to encourage people to get out of their cars and use their bicycles, would we make the roads more dangerous? and pollute the air, not only with exhaust students, but untold quantities of, arti of particulates of harms, harmful construction materials. This will drive concerned parents and residents back into their cars and increase the volume of traffic and congestion in what are supposed to be tranquil villages. So members of the committee, I ask you to support the office recommendation and save my residents from an abomination that will blight their lives and those of their children. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, I, I, you must do that, so I'll give you 10 seconds before you answer a question. Yeah. I get very emotional about this, I'm scared of a few tears, but this is, this is going to be so devastating. And can I just say it, and I swear, I know you can tell me where it is. We're going on to the but they got 750 responses. They weren't in approval. They were just responses. Councillor Hubbard. Sorry. It's just they were in law. They were in law. The other councillors may well want to ask questions. And councillors. If I don't need them. Any questions? No, well, in which case, I think, you, I think your, your point of view was well made, Councillor Hunter, and I don't think there would be any doubt on what you said. Uh, and so we're now going to break for lunch, but I would ask uh, if there's no misery, we will uh, rejoin uh, 20 shots, uh, 20 shots, and one. Uh, will people, will officers keep away from members and the members of the public keep away from any counselors because we should not have any contact during the lunch break? So it may not to me and I, I turn my back if I'm not willing to sit the way I have to be. So if you can, we're going to break now and the meeting is until the lunch break. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>